What's going on everyone? My name is Avery and you're watching the Crypto News Network. Today I'm doing my second video on the ZeroX protocol. This is part two in my explainer mini series for the project. So if you haven't seen the first one yet, then go ahead and click here and you'll get a good background on what I'll be talking about in this video. It seems like a lot of people liked my first video. So thanks for all the great feedback. It was actually super cool because after I posted this video on the ZeroX subreddit, someone from the ZeroX team added it to their internal YouTube playlist of explainer videos. So thank you for whoever did that. It was really cool for me to see. That being said, this video is not sponsored by ZeroX in any way. And like I said before, I'll try my best to make unbiased educational videos on my channel. So I had also said that I would address version two of the protocol as well as the criticisms of the protocol in general in my second video. But upon researching for it, I realized I probably bit off a little more than I could chew. So that stuff will be a part of my third video. In this second part of my explainer, I'm gonna be going over the details of ZeroX at a protocol level, hopefully showing everyone here how ZeroX works in a very clear way. Additionally, most of my info is sourced from the ZeroX white paper, so I encourage you to go read it if you haven't. And that's about it. So that's a long enough intro, so let's get into it. The protocol is intended to serve as an open standard and common building block, driving interoperability among decentralized applications or dApps that incorporate exchange functionality, meaning that any dApp with decentralized exchange capability can be built on top of this protocol. The founders of ZeroX believe that smart contracts should act as modular, unopinionated building blocks that can be assembled and reconfigured. So it opens the door for adoption and use cases across many different dApps. Decentralized exchanges implemented with Ethereum smart contracts have had a pretty rough time generating significant volume due to inefficiencies in their design that impose pretty high friction costs on market makers. So if you've ever used Ether Delta, you can probably relate to this. You know, posting, changing, or removing an order on the decentralized exchange costs gas, which if you mess up quite a bit can cost you a little bit of money and it leads to the user experience being quite difficult. Another inefficiency of current decentralized exchanges is that some maintain the order book on the blockchain, which causes bloat on the blockchain and latency issues while trading. In order to solve the latency issue of on-chain order books and other decentralized exchange issues, ZeroX uses a model called off-chain order relay and on-chain settlement. This model can combines the efficiencies of something called state channels with quick finality of on-chain order books. So how this works is cryptographically signed orders are broadcast off the blockchain. An interested counterparty may inject one or more of these orders onto a smart contract to execute trades trustlessly directly on the blockchain. With this off-chain order relay and on-chain settlement that I mentioned before, ZeroX enables two different types of orders. There are point-to-point -point orders and broadcast orders. I'll cover point-to-point -point first. Point-to-point point orders are used for the ZeroX OTC exchange called ZeroX OTC. For those of you that don't know, OTC is a term commonly thrown around the crypto space that describes an over-the-counter sale or trade of cryptocurrencies done in person or off of normal exchanges. Anyone can use the ZeroX protocol to implement their own point-to-point -point exchange also. In this table, ZeroX describes the message format of point-to-point -point orders. You can see from the table that the first row describes the address of a smart contract that enables point-to-point -point orders. Going further down, we see that the maker is the address originating the order. The taker is the address permitted to fill that order. Token A and token B are the tokens exchanged with the OTC deal, and value A and value B are the units of each token to be exchanged. If you're looking at the table and wondering what UINT256 means, it's just a placeholder that means unsigned integer of the max length of 256 bits. So in the simplest of terms, it's just a number. Variables V, R, and S comprise something called the ECDSA signature, which stands for Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm Signature. The signature gets verified on the ZeroX exchange contract so that a malicious actor can't generate a falsified order. Without the signature in place, one could generate an order parameters that say maker is selling 100 tokens of some amount, and then that same person could take it. So that's kind of like forging a check in some sort, I like to think of it. So so if we were to put this all together, that packet of data makes up the order. That order is a small message that could be sent through a variety of different sources like email or even Facebook Messenger. The cool part is that the order can only be filled by the specified taker address, rendering the order pretty much useless for eavesdroppers or outside parties. And here's a diagram that illustrates what I've just described. We have the maker, the taker, and the smart contract that makes it all work. You can see within the order that all the variables I previously described are involved in this order. 
Another add-on here is the expiration date of that contract, which can be set by the maker. The second thing enabled by the Zero X protocol is the broadcast orders, which I think is a more applicable portion of the protocol. This system consists of three different actors. There are the makers, takers, and relayers. A maker creates an order, a taker is someone who acts on that order, and a relayer is an entity that hosts and maintains an order book. You can sort of compare them to an exchange, except instead of having to operate proprietary software, manage user funds, and execute trades, a relayer facilitates signaling between market participants by hosting and propagating an order book. Relayers don't need to execute trades because takers execute their own trades, which is pretty interesting because a user of the protocol doesn't need to trust a relayer in order for a trade to be executed. If you go on the ZeroX website, you can see the current list of relayers such as Dex, Dharma, or Paradex. The message format for broadcast orders is slightly different from the point-to-point -point structure that I talked about previously. In this case, a broadcast order can be filled by anyone that wants to fill it, not just a specified address. Secondly, there is a transaction fee structure meant to incentivize the relayers and reward them for hosting an order book. So let's take a look at the message format in this case. The only differences between this one and the previous table is having to do with the relayer. So we can see that there's now a fee recipient, fee A, and fee B. Fee recipient is the address of the relayer where fees are allocated after a completed transaction. Fee A is the fees provided by the maker, and fee B is the fees provided by the taker. In this diagram, I'll explain how the broadcast order structure works. So in step one, we have a relayer cites a fee schedule and the address they use to collect transaction fees. Step two, the maker creates an order setting fee A and fee B to the values that satisfy the relayer's fee schedule, setting fee recipient to the relayer's desired receiving address, and signs that order with their private key. In step three, the maker transmits the signal order to the relayer. In step four, the relayer receives that order, checks that the order is valid and that it provides the required fees. If the order is invalid or does not meet the relayer's requirements, the order is rejected. If the order is satisfactory, the relayer posts the order to the order book. In step five, takers receive an updated version of the order book that includes the maker's order. And then in step six, the taker has the option to fill the maker's order by submitting it to the exchange contract on the Ethereum blockchain. So one thing that might have caught your ear was me saying that maker sets both fee A and fee B. Now this might not make a lot of sense because I said that fee B is provided by the taker, right? It's important to note that the relayers ultimately have control over which orders get posted. Therefore, if the maker wants their order to be posted to a specific order book, they must set fee A, fee B, and the fee recipient values to satisfy the relayer associated with said order book. Fees are negotiated off chain and relayers can change a fee schedule dynamically and at their own discretion. Once the relayer has accepted an order into their order book, the order's fee values cannot be changed. So the taker also has the option to act or not to act on that order. And if they do act on it, they're responsible for paying that fee B. So they are paying the fee B, they are responsible for that fee, but the maker, the other person on the other side is the one who's setting that fee. Getting into the order book aspect of Zero X, compared with traditional exchanges, what is normally used is a matching engine that fills market orders on behalf of the users. And then users have to trust that the prices shown aren't manipulated by the exchange. But because the Zero X protocol is essential centralized, relayers can't execute trades on behalf of makers or takers. What a relayer does is it can only recommend a best available price to the takers who must then independently decide to sign or not to sign and send that transaction to the blockchain. If you're wondering about fill orders and partial fill orders, the exchange smart contract stores a reference to each previously filled order to prevent a single order from being filled multiple times. A partial fill can be executed by the taker by specifying an argument called called value fill when calling the exchange smart contracts function. Here you can see that the argument is an unsigned integer that must be less than or equal to the total units of token A. Expiration time is set by the maker and references time stamps provided by the Ethereum virtual machine. As a maker, you can cancel the order, but it costs gas. The cancel function maps an order's hash to the order's maximum value, which prevents subsequent fills. So that was a bunch of info, but that's about all I can fit into this video. I hope you enjoyed it. It'll take me a few days to get part three out and part three is gonna have the governance model and some of the criticisms associated with Zero X. If you liked how I explained things here, please go and toss me a like and a subscription. That would be great. If you liked Zero X or dApps in general, please share this video. This video was put together with some fantastic resources that 
link in the description for everyone to check out. And if there's anything that I missed or got wrong in this video, please comment under the video. This was super technical, so if I did slip up, I apologize, but I did my best trying to give you guys good info. I look forward to chatting with you in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.